Hello, my name is Robert Sloan. I'm president of Houston Baptist University, and thank you for joining me in uh, this uh, second of the series that we are looking at on um, things that we might call the divine secrets, uh, or the hidden knowledge, or, or the Christian uh, insights or secrets to a, to a faithful, happy, joyous, uh, wise uh, Christian life, a meaningful Christian life. As I said in the introduction, I, I believe there are certain secrets that we can look at, and we're going to look at that. The, the Bible uses the language of, of, of mystery and revelation, of things hidden, things revealed, of, of secrets that are now disclosed. And, uh, and I want us to look at that. Um, and, and so uh, I welcome you back uh, in this series. The first thing I think we, we need to address is is what we might call the, the approach to the hour of stress. Because it's in an hour of stress that we begin to look for something. We begin to look for these particular secrets and insights. So there is, I think, a general approach uh, to the presence of God that is, um, is absolutely essential in all things. It can go by different words and by different uh, ways of experiencing uh, those words, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll start by using the word faith or trust or submissiveness or even, um, even a word like, like patience or a word like thanksgiving because when we give thanks, we are, we are bowing the knee before God. Paul says in Romans 1, 18 and following, that the beginning of all human sin and rebellion was not acknowledging God as God and refusing to give thanks. So this, this submissive heart, this trust that God is the Creator God, that the God of Scripture, the God who is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of the Bible, is the one true Creator God, not the idols, not the false gods, but the God whom we worship is the one true Creator God. And we approach Him as the Creator God. We approach Him as the one to whom we owe our allegiance. And as we approach Him with submissiveness, by definition we are acknowledging that He is the Creator and we are the creatures. He has made us and not we ourselves. We, we belong to Him. And therefore, we come to Him on bended knee. God is King over all the earth. It's one of the great confessions. You find it uh, throughout the Scriptures, uh, particularly, I think, in the Psalms and the worship literature of Israel. They, they cry out uh, in joy, uh, sometimes even in lament, but still in trust, that Yahweh, the Lord, our God, is King over all the earth. And of course, that kingship in the New Testament comes to expression through Jesus the Christ, the Anointed One, the King of Israel, uh, the, the great uh, King, in fact, uh, the Son of God, uh, which is another expression referring uh, to, to King, the, the Son of God over, over all the earth. So the approach, the, the, the ground floor foundational point of departure and beginning is trusting that even in moments of trouble and stress, in fact, maybe especially in moments of trouble and stress, God is at work. It's ironic because it's precisely in moments of stress and pain, physical, emotional, mental, um, that we feel alienated from God. And there's something to that because, of course, the one true Creator God made the world. He saw all that He had made. He saw that it was very good. And it was human rebellion that, uh, that alienated them from God, created the exile from the garden, created the separation, and thus also brought forth God's curse upon the human beings as they were sent in exile and even upon themselves and on their work and on their bodies and also the entire creation. Paul says that the created order, Romans 8, has had the curse of corruption placed over it because of human rebellion, which echoes, of course, what Genesis uh, has already told us in the opening chapters. So it's, it makes sense that we, when we suffer... We intuitively, it's a human experience to know that in pain and stress, we, 
we feel alienated from God and we ask the question, where is God? Does God know? Does God understand? Does God hear? In the hour of stress and trouble, the insight, the secret is that God is at work in this process. In fact, everything we know about suffering, think particularly of the horrible death of Jesus on the cross, is that God is ironically and strangely doing His most dynamic, powerful, counterintuitive, and unexpected work through suffering. The, uh, the idea of a secret, of course, if you think about it, um, this, is, uh, this is what secrets are. There are things that, that are not widely known, by definition a secret, not widely known, or if known, not as frequently thought about. Or if you once knew it, you sort of forgot it. It's seldom practiced, seldom used. That's the whole idea of a secret. It's not widely known or not widely practiced or not, not widely, not widely uh, appreciated. The other thing about a secret is that it often has a surprise element to it. Ah, uh, it has the aha moment. And, and that's, that's the thing about suffering. Ironically, just as with the death of Jesus, which, which Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2 was, was a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks, he said, it is nonetheless the means whereby the power of God and the wisdom of God are experienced and revealed historically and communicated to us by God's Spirit. It's, it's counterintuitive. But this is the pattern. It begins, it begins uh, surprisingly with the, with the unexpected death of the Messiah, God's agent to rule over all the earth, the, the king over all the earth, that he would suffer. It's precisely what the disciples and, the, and others did not expect of their Messiah. The two on the road to Emmaus said, we thought this one who was crucified would be the one who would redeem Israel. But, of course, they knew he couldn't be, even though they had heard rumors that he, had, at that point, had been raised from the dead. Uh, and then, of course, they realized that the stranger they were talking to was none other than the risen Jesus himself at some point later. Uh, but um, th this, is the, this is the, you might say, ironic, strange thing. And it's, the, it's, one of the, it's one of the unexpected insights of the Christian faith that the God who comes not only to make a good creation, but to heal us from the brokenness of this creation. The God who will one day set all things right and raise the dead and death will be no more. This God, in the meantime, is using suffering as some kind of environment and catalytic agent to communicate His presence. It is a very, very deep mystery. And you see this reflected uh, throughout the New Testament, just a, a couple of passages uh, to illustrate. Uh, for example, in, in James uh, chapter 1, verse three, verses 2 and 3, Consider it all joy, fellow Christians, when you encounter various distresses, trials, knowing, and James is referring to the knowing. It's, it's this, it's not the th sort of thing that everybody knows. It's the sort of thing that God's people know by experience but, and, and by virtue of being taught, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. But if you do lack what suffering is in the hands of God is designed to give, namely wisdom, then let him pray and ask God for it. Uh, James points to trial and suffering. You get the same sort of thing uh, in, in 1 Peter and 2 Peter uh, in the book of Revelation that, that trials and sufferings and affliction in the hands of God are a counterintuitive, strange, unexpected environment and catalytic agent. They're part of the recipe whereby God communicates His mercy and His presence. God was never more present to us than in the moment when Jesus died on the cross, followed, of course, by that surge of energy and power 
the new creation that began with the resurrection of Jesus. But there's another passage I want to share where you get this same sort of thing. It's very similar to, to James. In Romans 5, 1, Paul says, Therefore, having been declared innocent in God's courtroom, justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained, through Christ, our access, our beginning point, by faith, into this gracious relationship with God, standing in the presence of God, in which we now stand, and we boast, we worship, we celebrate in anticipation of the full, meaning uh, the resurrection and the restoration of all things, the full manifestation of the glory and presence of God. But not only this, not only do we rejoice in the glorious future that is now ours, having been declared innocent in God's courtroom, but we also rejoice now in our troubles. This is a very interesting thing. Paul is not a masochist. And he's not a, a self-inflicting martyr. He doesn't think we should seek pain. But his point is, is that tribulation and trouble is the environment, the catalyst, the situation in which God is powerfully at work. You and I must trust the Lord that He is at work in the worst moments of our stress and distress. This is one of the secrets. This is one of the insights. This is one of the bits of hidden knowledge that the world would call foolishness or, or idiocy. But it's one of the deep insights of the Christian faith. We rejoice in our tribulations, and Paul says, knowing, knowing that tribulation brings forth perseverance. Perseverance, proven character, proven character, hope. And the hope we have is not in vain because God has already demonstrated His love for us through the death of Jesus and already poured out His love within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. But Paul uses that word knowing, just like James did. It's the knowing of faith. It's the knowing of trust. It's knowing that somehow in these sufferings, God is teaching. Paul says something very similar, and I'll, I'll close with this passage. 2 Corinthians 1, uh, 8 and 9 and 10. I do not want you to be unaware, fellow Christians, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively Beyond our strength. That's the way I think many people feel right now. We're at our wit's end. We're beyond our strength. We're at the end of our rope. We, we have no more solutions. We have no more power. We have no more strength. This is precisely the moment in our weakness. When we are weak, then He is strong. 2 Corinthians 12, My grace is sufficient for you in the moment of the greatest thorn in the flesh. Paul says, We were burdened excessively beyond our strength. We despaired even of life. Indeed, he says, we expected to die. We had the sentence of death within ourselves. And then he gives, in retrospect, the purpose statement. He sees God's purpose in retrospect so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us, and He will deliver us as well on the last great day. God is at work. You are hurting your family can be hurting, your friends can be hurting, your church, your institutions, our, our institution of higher education here at HBU, we are experiencing those distresses and that hurt. Um, but here's what we must trust, that in a surprising, mysterious way, in the moment of stress and trial, our faith, our knowing, this is what we know by faith, is called forth. God is at work to do His good work in us and through us. God bless you. The Lord is at work in your life. Thanks for joining me to learn these secrets of the Christian faith.